and welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya. Today we discuss the first China-Arab summit which is ongoing in Saudi Arabia. China and the Gulf Cooperation Council are also meeting. We'll bring you the relevant aspects of these discussions on this show. Next, we've had enough. That's the message from primary healthcare doctors in Madrid, Spain. And finally, the International Olympics Committee has said it won't lift sanctions on Russian and Belarusian athletes. High-level discussions are on between visiting Chinese President Xi Jinping and leaders of the GCC in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. China's foreign ministry has called it the biggest diplomatic initiative between China and the Arab world. Xi's overtures to the Arab world are being seen as a significant intervention in shaping the region's orientation in the coming days. We'll go straight over to Abdul from People's Dispatch, who's here with us to discuss what's happening there. So, Abdul, what are the main points of this discussion? Well, there are many things. First, uh, the, the meeting, three days meeting, two and a half days meeting, is divided into two basic parts. One is a bilateral emphasis on bilateral relations between Saudi Arabia and China. And they have already signed uh, various deals uh, uh, worth around $30 billion, which basically uh, expand, spans from uh, B Belt and Road Initiative to uh, the technology, to cooperation in the fields of infrastructure development and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, it is the fact that the Saudi Arabia is trying to diversify its economy and uh, 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 investing away from the oil and gas fields, which is basically the traditional dominant economic uh, areas in Saudi Arabia. And uh, it, they are looking towards China to basically invest and provide other, ki other kind of uh, support there. So that is one part of the, uh, this particular visit in, in the Arab world. Uh, the other is a very significant move of uh, two different uh, summits. One specifically with uh, uh, Gulf Cooperation Council. The, the members of the Gulf Cooperation Council as a whole, are the, uh, they create the largest trading block with China. The okay. GCC and China are basically uh, already involved in a, a, a huge uh, bilateral trade. But there is, there is an attempt made to make it even bigger while there are discussions on creating a free trade uh, agreement between the GCC and China. So that is one part. Apart from that, there is an attempt by China to create a strategic relationship between GCC as a whole and China. So that is one. Uh, uh, as far as the summit between the Arab countries and uh, 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 China is concerned, they are primarily looking towards expanding the existing cooperation uh, in areas such as built and road uh, cooperation, sorry, initiative, uh, global development initiative, global security uh, uh, initiative. These are the different terms used by Chinese. These are the different kinds of uh, large scale programs devised by the Chinese to create a global uh, cooperation network with the developing countries all across the world. Okay. And Arab, uh, as for the Chinese perspective, Arab world is a very significant area where there is a huge prospect of uh, creating uh, strong and deeper roots uh, uh, of bilateral and multilateral relationships. Right. So such a big diplomatic uh, initiative, uh, you know, what would be the significance beyond the trade ties that they're trying to talk about? Well, uh, there are many uh, geostrategic and geopolitical uh, uh, aspects w uh, of these uh, different summits which are ongoing there. Uh, particularly given the fact that in the last uh, few months or, or maybe years, we have seen a, a, a realignment in the region uh, when it comes to the global politics. Uh, in uh, Earlier this year, uh, when Biden visited uh, uh, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, there was, uh, so in, with the objective of kind of reducing, uh, uh, preventing uh, OPEC to not reduce the oil, overall oil production, right. we uh, noticed that uh, uh, the Saudis did not uh, uh, give much importance to what US was uh, willing to, uh, was asking to. Uh, given in, uh, then there are other uh, uh, indications in which it is quite visible that the overall Arab countries are not very happy with the uh, the U.S. attempts to 
constantly intervene. The U.S. is involved in wars in Syria. U.S. is involved in war in Yemen. In Iraq, it was involved in the war in Iraq. It has military presence, and there is a constant uh, 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 talk about how uh, U.S. has used its influence, economic power, and military power in the region to create conflicts, to kind of add, uh, to prolong the conflicts, and have ha has not been able to achieve any uh, 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 development when it comes to the core areas of conflict in Palestine and in other areas. So given the larger and also economically uh, the investment which the Arab countries have been looking for by, uh, from US and its uh, European allies has not materialized. In that particular context, uh, given the fact that China is an economic emerging power and it is emerging as the second largest economy and it is much more willing to uh, uh, invest in developing countries, uh, there is an uh, there is a uh, 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 there is a uh, kind of some kind of uh, vibe to shift uh, uh, towards a, a kind of uh, uh, orientation shift towards look east policies. Okay. So most of the Arab countries are trying to diversify their sources of investment and uh, uh, reduce their dependence on the uh, uh, United States and uh, China. They they see China as an alternative. So in that particular context, uh, this summit is very significant and it may have, a, 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 we are not sure about it, but it may have a larger impact on the regional reorientation and the uh, change in the global dynamics as well. Right, Abdul, thanks a lot for joining us with that update. Thousands of health workers have been protesting in Madrid since November 21. Doctors working in primary health care have joined these protesters. They say longer working hours in public health translate into poor quality of health care. They say Madrid spends much less on health services than the rest of Spain. The strikers say it is not just about wages but recruitment across levels. They are warning that private health care cannot substitute underfunded public health care. And they say that working conditions are at their worst state today, worse than even during the COVID-19 pandemic. Anna from People's Dispatch has been following the strike and she's here to tell us what the problems and demands are. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. Anna, what seems to be happening in Madrid seems to be a very, very important strike. The doctors have joined the healthcare workers in their protest. You know, can you just give us the reasons for the protest and also some of the reactions? What have been the responses? So, uh, yes, you're, you're quite right. Uh, this is something that actually has been uh, building up for a couple of, uh, couple of months now, uh, we can say. Uh, one of the major events that happened was on November 15th, uh, when thousands of people in Madrid protested against a reform uh, of, uh, of emergency, uh, emergency services and in protection of universal and public health care. And so one week after that, so on November 20, uh, 21st, uh, doctors uh, in primary health care, so family physicians and pediatricians in particular, uh, launched a strike, an open-ended strike, uh, in, uh, in order to, uh, to warn about the worsening working conditions that they, uh, they were facing because of lack of investment uh, in this part of health care, uh, and also to advocate for, for, uh, for improvements to be made to the system. So, you know, this is a strike that's now uh, finishing its third week. Uh, there are no uh, no signs that it's going to end. So it's something that's really, you know, the doctors uh, are quite stubborn and they're quite uh, quite decisive in the actions that they, that they're doing. So uh, it's uh, it's something that will uh, that will be interesting to follow in the weeks to follow as well. And so, uh, as I said, you know, uh, the reasons behind both the protests and the strike are quite interesting, uh, because if we look uh, at, uh, at the healthcare system uh, in Spain, uh, Madrid is one of the richest regions uh, in the country, yet it, uh, it's one that invests less uh, in healthcare than, uh, than any par other part of the country. And this is particularly true for primary healthcare. Uh, which we know is very important because, you know, it's the first point of contact that people have uh, with, with the healthcare system. Uh, and according to the doctors who are on strike, Madrid only invests in the primary healthcare system uh, a bit more than 10% 10 10 of the overall uh, health budget, which is very, very low. You know, it's, 
it's low even in comparison to other regions uh, in Spain, where uh, that mean is closer to 14%. And 14% is, uh, is in itself uh, not too much. And right. the 14% has been raised as an issue uh, during the campaign uh, on International Health Day or People's Health Day uh, just this year. So activists uh, and health workers have advocated uh, for municipalities and regions to raise the investment in primary health care at least to 25%. So, Anna, what, what's actually very curious about this is that when there is a region which already is spending the least compared to other, uh, the mean of the other regions, then why is, it seems that, in fact, the funding is also the sticking point in the negotiations. And the other thing that we noticed was that the protesters are saying that, look, this is not just about wages. We want more recruitment. Can you just explain some of these uh, aspects? Yes. So, uh, again, you're absolutely correct, you know, uh, and it's something that we have seen in strikes by health workers, not only in Spain, but in other, in, in other parts of, uh, of the world. So one key issue that the health workers uh, are, uh, are stressing when they go on strike is that they're striking uh, not for themselves. They, they're striking for their patients. They're striking for public health systems which can cope with, uh, with the needs of people who are coming there. And so uh, this is one of the spins that uh, the governments who are not pro-worker oriented usually do, is that they say that the workers are only, uh, only interested in their own interests and that uh, by striking they actually uh, are putting their patients patients in danger. So uh, it's uh, mm, according to the reports, according to the to the impressions by the by the workers in Madrid now. Uh, this mm, might not have been so so much the case uh, in in this instance, but it is true that the government, the regional government in Madrid, which is uh, uh, which is right wing and which has been in power for uh, for several years now. Uh, has tried to spin the story about the strike in another direction. So it's saying that, you know, uh, while they don't want to actually negotiate about the funds that, that the primary healthcare system needs, uh, they're saying that it's a political strike, that it's a strike which was orchestrated uh, to, to damage them before the local election comes uh, next year. So this is something that, that they're all, uh, also seeing on the ground. Uh, and which is, of course, also uh, a depiction of how the, the local government feels about healthcare. It's a political decision, of course, not to invest in health. It's something that, you know, uh, it damages uh, the public health system uh, and it prioritizes, it gives a lot of space to, uh, to, private, to the private sector. And this is something that we know it's true in Madrid, where the regional president, uh, Isabel Diaz, uh, so she has made several statements and uh, she has actually made several steps which, uh, which essentially put the private sector over the public. It's not a surprise, therefore, that the local government doesn't actually want to do uh, much. At least they don't want to take any concrete steps in these negotiations. Uh, and so the negotiations at the moment are quite stalled. It's not quite certain what's going to happen in the next days. There have been reports that the government has offered uh, the physicians some things. So, for example, one uh, one of their grievances is about the number of people they they see each day, uh, because it's a very high number. They're not they're not able to dedicate more than a couple of minutes to each patient. And so, uh, allegedly, the government is saying, "Okay, so we'll cap the number, and you will have to see uh, most uh, at, uh, 34 patients at most if you're a family doctor, if you're a pediatrician, 24 kids." Uh, but at the same time, they're not making sure to explain what's going to happen to the other people, because it's not that, you know, the people just go to the doctor because they want to have fun. They actually need the doctor. So if you cap the number, where are, where are the rest of people going to go? And that's something that the physicians also want to, uh, you know, for the government to address. It's not only about making empty promises. It's also about showing that there's a material base for, for implementing the things that, uh, that they're, they're saying they want to do. 
Right, Anna, thanks a lot for that update. Thanks. International Olympics Committee Chief Thomas Bach has said it will stick to excluding Russia and Belarus. The IOC's ban had kicked in after the Russia-Ukraine war began in February. Does it mean these countries are excluded from the qualifying process for the 2024 Paris Olympics? Uh, but Bach has also said that the IOC will try to find ways to fulfill what he called the unifying mission of sports. What could this mean? We asked Sidhan Dane. All right, Sidhan, thanks for joining us. Um, Sidhan, what has the IOC actually said? Uh, there's a statement which, uh, uh, according to the IOC chief, the teams should be uh, banned, but the players should be included. Is this actually something feasible? Yeah, so uh, there is a precedent to it, uh, Pragya, at the Olympics for sure. Uh, for example, it, it happened in the case of Indian athletes as well, uh, when the Indian Olympic Association was actually banned uh, because of uh, misgovernance issues or interference, third-party interference. Uh, so at the uh, Winter Olympics, where Shiva Keshavan, who, who is a multiple-time Olympian, was participating, uh, in fact, the Indian flag was not unfurled or hoisted uh, at the Games Village until they were midway through the event itself when the ban was kind of uh, rescinded and then uh, that whole ceremony took place and then he was uh, they were allowed to compete under the national flag. So there is a precedent in the Olympics for athletes whose uh, Olympic associations are banned uh, to compete at, at the Games under the flag of uh, just the Olympic flag. So, so the credit for their medals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, doesn't go to the country, uh, but the athletes themselves are allowed to compete. Uh, but the issue here is is uh, far bigger than that because the sanctions on Russian as well as Belarusian athletes uh, extend much further than just the Olympic Committee. So, so according to the IOC and the instructions that it has given to the various uh, international sports federations, uh, athletes from Russia and Belarus will not be allowed to participate in events at all which means their qualification for the Olympics itself uh, is in jeopardy or is in doubt uh, at the very least. Uh, there are, of course, uh, there's over a year left for the Paris Olympic Games, but this is the year, it will be a crucial year, 2013, uh, 2023, sorry, uh, wh when a lot of qualifying events will take place. For There are 32 uh, different sports that are going to be held in Paris. Over 10,000 athletes will compete, 50% men, 50% women. Uh, so, so uh, the, over the next year, we'll know exactly who is competing and who is not. And as of now, the IOC had its executive board meeting. Uh, yesterday was, I think, the last day at Lausanne, where its headquarters are uh, in Switzerland. And, and as of now, they said they had extremely deep and detailed discussions on the subject. But they unanimous, unanimously feel that this is not the time to be lifting uh, the sanctions that have been imposed on uh, both these countries. Actually, this has been a subject of much debate even earlier and I think there's been some kind of a sanction imposed, a sort of penalty imposed on uh, one of the uh, boards or associations which tried to ban Russian and Belarusian authorities. Yeah, it's it's a bit confusing actually what's going on in various different sports. Uh, tennis, for example, has taken a stand where individual athletes from these two nations were not allowed to participate. Now, while the Olympics, uh, Olympic Association itself has imposed these sanctions on Russia and Belarus. Uh, at the same time, they have come out against the tennis uh, tours, or, or Wimbledon in particular, uh, saying, you know, there's no reason or, or it, it is not fair for you to have uh, excluded these athletes uh, from participating. So, uh, I think it's a question of who is actually in charge in terms of uh, running or or who are the powerful parties that are running each of these federations and and i think we can see where uh, the strengths lie more with western europe and, and those parts of the world uh, in those cases the the voices or, or the vocalizing of this russia ban uh, cause has been the loudest sebastian ko for example the british athlete who heads world athletics at the moment uh, he he uh, simplified the situation uh, by saying, you know, it, it's quite simple. Get out of Ukraine and you get to play. Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, the scenario on the ground in Ukraine is far more complex than just that. And uh, while the Olympics might be a major factor uh, in, in the world, uh, I don't know how much it will determine the wider decision-making process uh, with regards to Russia's operations in Ukraine. And of course, how the, the, the wider political scenario unfolds uh, I, as well. 
That means how long the war continues and what the IOC decides next. Yeah, yeah. The IOC also has, has made it clear that at this point, they do not want to make any kind of firm comment on Russia or Belarus's participation at the Olympics itself. Uh, because there is still a lot of time and and uh, like like the spokesperson uh, has said the situation is changing sometimes on a daily basis so so they will uh, you know they'll give it some time see how things go and then probably come to uh, a decision much closer to the date right sadan thanks a lot for joining us anytime and that's all we have for you today thank you for watching daily debrief we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow you will find more such stories on our website peoplesdispatch.org and you can find us on facebook twitter and instagram